In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Pope Gregory XVI wrote in his encyclical Meraribos, quote, Nor can we predict happier times for religion and government from the plans of those who desire vehemently to separate the church from the state and to break the mutual concord between temporal authority and the priesthood. It is certain that that concord, which always was favorable and beneficial for the sacred and the civil order, is feared by the shameless lovers of liberty." In 1964, in the encyclical Quanta Cura, which has issued the document, the Syllabus of Errors, under number 55 we read, by Pope Pius IX, the church ought to be separate from the, church, from the state and the state from the church as a condemned proposition. In the encyclical he wrote, which false and perverse opinions are on that ground the more to be detested, because they briefly tend to this, that the salutary influence be impeded and even removed, which the Catholic Church, according to the institution and command of her divine author, should freely exercise even to the end of the world, not only over private individuals, but over nations, peoples, and their sovereign princes, and tend also to take away that mutual fellowship and concord of the councils between church and state, which has ever proved itself propitious and salutary, both for religious and civil interests. This is an important point, because what the Pope is pointing out is that the church has a divine right passed on given to it because by divine authority Christ gave to it the matter, the, the right to pass judgment on matters that pertain to faith and morals. Now there are certain things with the, which the state also passes judgment on which also pertains to morals. And therefore because their spheres overlap to a certain degree, it means that in the eyes of the church, the church always had the right to pass judgment on whether the state's judgments in those matters, its laws, etc., fulfilled the requirements of the natural law and the divine positive law. Leo XIII wrote in his encyclical Libertas Prestantissimum, there are others somewhat more moderate, though not more consistent, who affirm that the morality of individuals is to be guided by the divine law, but not the morality of the state for that in public affairs the commands of God may be passed over and may be entirely disregarded in the framing of laws. Hence follows the fatal theory of the need of separation between church and state. But the absurdity of such a position is manifest. Nature herself proclaims the necessity of the state providing means and opportunities whereby the community may be enabled to live properly, that is to say according to the laws of God. For since God is the source of all goodness and justice, it is absolutely ridiculous that the state should pay no attention to these laws or render them abortive to contrary enact menu. Now, what Leo XIII is asserting is is what St. Thomas Aquinas says, that the principal end of the state is happiness, and that is the happiness of its citizens. What does this happiness consist in? It consists in acts of virtue. In other words, the state's whole function is to make sure that the citizens can lead virtuous lives so that they can attain their final end, which is ultimately the beatific vision. Now, the finality of the state proximately, that is what it's properly or directly ordered to immediately, is this virtue of its citizens. But that itself is remotely ordered to the end for which the church was constituted, which is to lead to the beatific vision, that is our happiness in heaven. This means, therefore, that if the state separates and does not have to consider the morality that God had established, then they are, by that very fact, vitiating against the very structure and nature of a state which is constituted for the happiness of its citizens. For it is impossible for the citizens to be happy when they act immorally. Pope Pius X condemned the separation of church and state in France, in his encyclical Vehementer Nos, writing that the state must be separate from the church is a thesis absolutely false, a most pernicious error. Hence, the Roman pontiffs have never ceased, as circumstances required, to refute and condemn the doctrine of separation of church and state. So, in the eyes of Pius, so Pope St. Pius X, this has been a constant teaching of the pontiffs always that there cannot be a separation of church and state until recently. This has been a problem since the Second Vatican Council. 
Pope Benedict asserts that the separation of church and state is, quote, a specific achievement of Christianity and one of its fundamental historical and cultural contributions. Now, it's hard to see how it can be an achievement and a contribution when it's systematically condemned by the prior popes as an error. So what does this mean? Does this mean the pope's not the pope? No, it means he's a pope. It just means that because he's not speaking infallibly in these particular instances, he can fall into error. There are some basic principles about, okay, what do you do when one pope says one thing and other popes say another? Well, it's quite simple. The preponderance of the evidence is the general principle. So the number of, if there's a number of popes that say it's condemned, but one comes along and says, no, it's okay, you follow the tradition because of the fact that there's a consistency and God would not allow the church for a long period of time to consistently teach error. It's not possible. Franzeline, who was an expert at the First Vatican Council and probably the person who wrote the document on infallibility, wrote in his book in dealing with what do you do when one pope says one thing and one pope says another. And he says, well, if it's something that is consistently clear throughout the tradition, he says, it's his opinion that you do have to disregard what the subsequent pope says because it's not in congruity with the tradition. But then he makes another observation, another location, which is quite important in this particular context. He says, that infallibility is not exercised just in the documents of an ecumenical council, not just in a papal bull where he says, I hereby define and declare by virtue of my office to bind all Christians in the church, etc. He says it doesn't, there's not, infallibility isn't just in those instances. He says it's also in um, canonization. So, for example, when you canonize somebody, that the, it's been a constant teaching of the church for the most part, that is, I should say, the, the theologians, that whenever a pope canonizes someone, we have certitude that they're in heaven and that it's infallible. But another one he says is when he refers to papal condemnations. He says papal condemnations, when they're definitive, are infallible. And he says, for example, the condemnation of separation of church and state. So it's a case in which the prior pontifical pronouncements on this were infallible, the current one is not, and so we follow the prior position. Philosophically, separation of church and state is absolutely unsustainable. Once the, and why is this? Once the state asserts that there is a separation of church and state, it has already violated that separation because it's pronounced judgment on the church's doctrine of separation in church and state. So even the state doesn't believe that when it purports that. And what it has done is place itself above the church, the state has. And this brings up another particular difficulty. There is a metaphysical principle, it's self-evident. And basically this principle states this. If in a particular category of being there are two things that are different, there is, a, there is by necessity an inequality. What does that mean? Well, for example, in a family, you're in the, you're in the category of um, family relations, right? Now, this means that when you're talking about the parents to the children, when it comes to the category of being a human being, they're equal. But when it comes to the category of the governance of the family, they're not. Because the children are below the parents, despite the fact that today it seems to be a problem that kids are telling the parents what to do. But the fact is that in the category of governance, there is an inequality and therefore one is above the other. This is always the nature of the situation. It's, it's self-evident, to deny it is absurd. The problem is, is that when you're talking about separate, when you're talking about the church and the state, because some of the matter that they both judge on touches upon the same sphere, that means that whosoever judgment will finally take precedence is based upon whichever is the higher. In other words, because they're in the same category, that is passing judgment on the behavior of, a, of, of citizens and of people, that means that they are by nature unequal. So one of them has to be above the other. There's absolutely no way that they can be equal because if there comes a contradiction, somewhere something has to resolve it. The separation of church and state 
is really the state's way of usurping the authority of the Catholic Church and asserting itself over it by pronouncing a judgment on its doctrine, and especially on its moral code. This is obviously clear in something like abortion, where the Church has said, no, it's immoral. The Church state says we don't have to basically follow the, divine, the natural law, which is how it got there to begin with, which is one of the observations I made in an earlier homily. Separation of church and state is a complete ruse, because the state, in many countries, is gaining ascendancy over the church, it's a power grab, over the church by raiding its archives and chancers and demanding documentation, etc. The fact that it very does that is an assertion on the side of the state that it's above the church. Now, the Catholic Church, so people say, well, you know, the state has to kind of assume this position because there's all these different religions and we don't know which one is the true religion. That's just complete trash. We all know that the Catholic Church is the only divinely established means of salvation. It was to the magisterium of the Catholic Church alone that God conceded authority to bind and loose moral matters on earth and in heaven. Therefore, <clears throat> it only pertains to the Catholic Church to be that which passes judgment on the state. This means, therefore, that because the state is required to follow the natural law of which one of its first precepts is to obey God, it means they must obey that authority and submit themselves to that authority which was conceded to the magisterium directly by Christ who is God. That means, therefore, that only the Catholic Church has a right to pass judgment the Protestants don't. Why? Because God didn't concede it to Luther. Christ didn't say to Luther, you have right to bind and loose. He didn't give it to Muhammad. He didn't give it to any other religion. It's the Catholic Church alone that has the right to make that claim. Therefore, no other religion has the right to make that claim. Again, the natural law demands obedience to God. And this also means that God promulgated the divine cause of law to which the state must submit. The state must submit to revelation because it's from God. And how do we know this? Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore teach ye all nations. Christ specifically gave the apostles the right to teach every nation what they are bound to obey. And this is a very important point. This means that the state must be confessionally Catholic in order to fulfill the requirements of the, of the natural and divine cause of law to, because they must accept what is revealed. Since the state is constituted by the citizens, that is, the people that constitute the state, since every individual is bound in conscience, according to the natural law, to follow the divine positive law, because it's God who's come to, uh, to tell it, and the natural law tells us we must obey, then the state itself must be confessionally Catholic. Now, this does not mean that the state has to, uh, they still have to tolerate other religions. What they can and cannot allow is a whole different homily. But the point is, is that the state itself must submit to Catholic teaching, ultimately. Anything else is condemnable and leaves a nation open to destruction. The wages of sin is death. If you refuse to follow the divine positive law, which means you're going to follow the Catholic Church, and if you're going to refuse to follow the natural law, you have already sown the principles and seeds of destruction into the very fabric of the nation. We also know this is a ruse anyway. We also know that the state is lying to us when they say separation of church and state. They want control of the church. We all know that. It's obvious. We see that in what happened in Belgium. We're actually seeing what is happening in, even in this, in this country. The fact of the matter is, is whenever they say separation of church and state, it's just like the liberals who run around claiming, we need more democracy, we need more democracy. Yeah, you're only saying that so that you can weasel in to destroy the authority of the person in charge, so that you can get the authority, and then what do you do? Like all liberals, they are absolutely dictatorial. And this we are seeing. 
the fact that they're cramming legislation down our throat when it's manifestly against the will of the people. This is a sign, it's the same kind of behavior when they sit there and they say, you know, no separation of church and state, or this, that, or the fact of the matter is, is what they're really doing is it's a power grab. The health of any state is directly proportionate to the degree that its laws and constitutions are in accord with the teachings of the Holy Roman Catholic faith. Anything less, and the seeds and principles of destruction and annihilation have already been sown. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen.